All right, you creeps and freaks and horror host fanatics. Just like vampires, sometimes horror hosting needs fresh blood, and this man is part of that. He is Linwood S. Sharp, a.k.a. Gregor the Grave Digger. How are you, sir? I'm fair to Medlin. How are you doing? <laughs> now, I haven't heard that for a while. That makes me feel at home. Oh, that's good. Um, uh, You're from Virginia, right? Yes, sir. Myself the same. So let me ask you, are you a monster kid? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, not in the technical sense, because I'm, I'm younger. I wasn't born in the um, 50s, 60s. Did it go on through the 70s? I think it's I think never it's stopped. I think it's 50 or 60. Yeah. Um, but in the... I guess in the impractical sense, I'd say so. I'd have to say so. Like I, few things around here that would ev certainly evoke that type of feel. Yes. Do you have how far back can you go as far as a horror, scary sort of memory? How far back yeah, does that go for you? Because that's two things. One is when I saw like a monster, and when something actually scared me. I remember when something actually scared me. It was um, Large Merge from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Terrified the crap out of me. I mean, I'm, I must have been like four or five years old. And it looks like when you see it today as a dot, you're like, but yeah, that, that'll do it. Yes, sir. You, it comes you out never of saw it coming. Yeah. Exactly. How about the first time you saw a monster let's say a monster well i was very big in dinosaurs i mean when i was growing up there was jurassic park and every other tv show or movie they so uh kind of a love of dinosaurs turned into a love of giant monsters and it kind of um kind of just some um, went off of that for a while so I was really big into Godzilla uh, I got one him he's up there somewhere somewhere about um, but saw a bunch of Godzilla stuff, King Kong, Tarantula, all the B-movie monsters. And I did grow up with MST3K. Um, when my brother, my older brothers first told me there was a show that came on late night about robots who make fun of movies. I, I just thought they were messing with me. I was like, no way. Because it sounds like the most ridiculous thing when you say it like that. So you're a Godzilla fan. Can I ask mm -hmm. what what era is your most beloved? Uh, probably Shawa. The Matthew I like Broderick the SI. one. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you even ask me that? <laughs> it was a movie. It exists. Sorry, I can't help it. I don't know if you ever seen um Steve Rives book, um Japan's favorite monster unauthorized biography of the big G. It's like uh it's like maybe it's a big thick book, maybe 200, 300 pages, and like an actual big size book. I grew up with that as a kid. I read the entire thing front and back. It's awesome. Man. So where did where did the Matthew Broderick one go wrong? Because it to me, it wasn't uh, another guest said if they had called it the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, he might would have liked it better. It, it was kind of a remake of the beast from 20,000 Phantoms. Like if you're going to pay that much for a franchise, like actually use it like all the, in my opinion, all the money they paid to Toho. Uh, it's just wasted. It's just like, what did you a end up using? You they, they ended up using the same, virtually the same idea of anything else. True. And he didn't destroy a single belly. Grew up with Dr. Gruesome, I'm assuming. Somewhat. And uh, here's how this happened. Um, so Dr. Gruesome came on TV when I was kind of too young. If I saw that, I was too young to remember. 
then but then they had this anniversary special um where he showed Gappa the Trephibian monster. But the biggest thing about it was I was kind of perplexed when I saw this guy just in like the middle of a movie. And but my older brother was like, Don't you know who that is? I was like, I I don't know who that is, but like I do want to know what it is if <laughs> he's somebody I should know who it is. So if, effectively, my brother just kind of acted like a hype man. Because it's my older brother saying, don't you know who this is? I'm naturally like, now now I'm interested. That's one thing I miss is uh, the very local nature of horror hosting. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of, where can all the creeps find Gregor the Gravedigger? Yeah, you can find Gregor the Grave Digger by virtually typing Gregor the Grave Digger into any social media platform. Um, you can also go to weirdhalloween.com. That's my website. That actually, I've had that around longer than I've had Gregor, but all the links are there. Growing up, how much did Dr. Gruesome influence your character? Um, so it's actually interesting because I didn't just grow up with Dr. Gruesome. As far as horror hosts, I would say I had between six or seven. And that nice. sounds like an outrageous number. <laughs> but it it's weird because every I've had horror hosts throughout my life, but they would in one would come in, one would leave, one would go in, one would leave in like the oddest ways. Um, I think even before I saw Dr. Gruesome on TV, um, my brother was really big into novelty music. So he played a lot of Weird Al. You heard, um, if you're familiar with the song Fish Heads or yes. King Cream. But one of the ones he played was Zachary. And he played it constantly. So I would, even though it's not my era or generation at all, I grew up listening to um, Coolest Little Monster. Um, he had this um, commercial for Goldview. If you're cramped, then you're crap. Come to... I'm not going to sing it because I don't want you to get copyright <laughs> flack. Uh, Zachary Lee is for president. So that was really good. The humor really stuck with me. You know? Of course, I, I had the Adams family growing up. And I did catch a lot of TV land. So I did see the monsters and all that. And I really liked that particular type of humor because it's not just like graveyard humor it's the horror in the wheel weird but it's in the real world it's right. interacting in a real context that's extremely appealing then later i saw dr gruesome but also and people might not well he is a horror host technically roger corman and I don't know if you know where that happened, but AMC had a annual show called Monster Fest. And yes. if I'm familiar, you have a you're in Australia right now. Yes, sir. I think you have a Monster Fest completely unrelated. Uh, um, not that I'm aware of, but I'm sure there is. Yeah, because I googled it, and that was the only thing that was coming up. There right. was, of course, a few people who remember the older show. But every year um, since it was 1998, uh, AMC would do this movie marathon that was hosted. I think the first couple of years they had Tim Burton on or maybe just the first. But um, Roger Corman, he hosted Monster Fest in 1999. The thing about it, even though it was it would last a few days, but only even because it was a few days. I had these magical things called VHS tapes, <laughs> which um, for I don't know how, what your age or viewership is, but it's these it, they're these they're not desks, but they're square, but they're like this. They go into a machine called a VCR. <laughs> and if you wanted to record something, you had to hit the pause button every time a commercial break happened. Well, uh, I recorded those. A lot of Godzilla movies during that. A lot of Godzilla movies. Like there was a day for this, a day for that. God's I wish I could have watched the whole thing. But they were broadcasting well into the AM hours. And my younger self just wasn't going to. 
Though the interesting thing is they also had a tie-in movie, a movie that was made just for Monster Fest, directed by Roger Corman, called The Phantom Eye. And The Phantom Eye was about Roger Corman, he's hosting Monster Fest, because it's a tie-in, and two interns come in, and he traps the interns into movie worlds. Some in actual movies, but they have to just go through movie and movie until they find this film called The um, Phantom Eye. I don't think it's ever been released on DVD. I think some I put it on YouTube. I think it's currently up on YouTube. But that was really cool. So not only did you get a host, but this movie, The Phantom Eye, was chopped up in like 35 different parts. So during the breaks, you would get Roger Corman hosting the movie. Then you would get a piece of the story, The Phantom Eye. Yeah, so um, when I did my show, it has a lot of story, but it also has a lot of posting. Because I must have watched those tapes like hundreds of times. So even though Roger Corman was only a horror host for a short time on TV, since I had the tapes, I, I continued to watch them for like years. And who better, really, than Roger Corman? He gave us so many cool movies. Yeah, and um, they had other hosts. They had, like um, like I said, they had Tim Burton, and they had Linda Blair, and they had Whoopi Goldberg, <laughs> inexplicably. I mean, she's great. Don't get me wrong. She's great. Maybe in the contract, she has to do everything. So it's like, well, this is everything. We're going to put be. you in there. Um, but... Roger Corman influenced it a lot. So did, um, well, Doc, Dr. Gruesome had the distinction of actually being called a horror host. So it really familiarized me with that concept. And even for years, I didn't think of Roger Corman as a horror host, even though he did exactly the same thing as everybody else. He came on, gave you some information, introduced the movie. But, um... It, it wasn't obvious. Now, I did get some DVDs that were purchased. And one day I put a Godzilla movie in. And inexplicably, there was this mysterious woman with black hair and a long black dress and some other things. And I was really confused. I was like, told my mom, mom mama, who's this? Why is there this woman in my movie? <laughs> he said, that's Elvira. Yeah, Elvira is pretty ubiquitous, and uh, I think mo a lot of general public, when they think horror host, mm -hmm. it's either Elvira, maybe Joe Bob Briggs, or Zvenguli. Yeah. Now, I was familiar with Joe Bob Briggs, the same brother who introduced me to Dr. Gruesome, but he introduced me to Joe Bob Briggs in a completely different way. He, he said, yeah, this is a person who talks before movies. Interesting. Didn't hype him up at all. <laughs> Interesting. That's, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, I kind of consider, uh, for me, horror host is a big umbrella because I consider yeah. even MST 3000, I consider that horror yeah, host. Yeah, and, and Rod Serling is a, I grew up with that. So, like, it's, for me, it's uh, Zachary, but not in the, for saying her horror hosting, but certainly Zachary, Dr. Gruesome, Roger Corman, Elvira. Rod Serling, MST3K. And I'm pretty sure there's probably a couple I'm leaving out. So you had quite a rich, really quite a rich field yeah. to, to mine, really. Yeah, it's like, and they were all different, but they're all great. It's so cool to see younger people doing it as well. For, mm -hmm. a, long, for a long time, it seemed like it was the realm of like, my age, uh, older mm -hmm. guys, but it's so cool to see the young blood coming in. But can you tell us how you who is Gregor? Uh, what's his backstory? Uh, Gregor. And, you know, it's funny. So when I originated the character, I did not originate it to be a horror host. See, I had a Twitter account for my website, Weird Halloween, and I looked at my Facebook page and the face, the profile picture for the pr Facebook page, it had a like a character I drew. It wasn't Gregor, but I found out if you have a profile with a human face, it does a lot better than one was just like a brand logo. True. So it's like, okay, I'm going to create a character for Twitter. Now, 
I knew about Horror House, but I said, okay, so he's going to be like that. And, um, but I, I need like a name. I need like a profile picture. And as luck would have it, uh, I think this was a few months before I did, I was hired for like a month at Screen Rant. And I had to make a profile picture just, you know, because they have the chat windows. So I, I took a picture of myself, but it was during COVID. So I had like long hair. I had like mud and chops. And I was like, oh, God, that's a terrible picture. I'm going <laughs> to clean myself up tomorrow. And I had the picture on my phone. So I was like, what picture can I use for Gregor? I was like, hey, I have this hideous photo of myself. And the only thing is I that I changed the hue. I changed it to give him like a greener shade, I think in the original. Gregor's never a consistent shade of green in any of the pictures, I think. But I think in the original, he was maybe like a turquoise, but it was nice because it looked like there was this soft moonlight hitting him. Right. I also photoshopped a little. I gave him like staples on his neck. There was I had some slime dripping in the background. And I was thinking about what to what he should be. And I kind of love stock characters, like the nameless background characters in movies. And one of these happens to always be grave diggers. Because in a horror movie, you have the grave digger. He's usually never given her a name, never given any kind of character development. He's just this kind of creepy guy that wanders around carrying a lantern, maybe. So it's like, okay, I want to do a I want to do, do a grave digger. Then I thought, oh, what's his name going to be? Well, f originally I thought of Conrad. And I thought of Conrad because of Conrad Brooks. Because when I was growing up, my dad got a lot of dollar DVDs from the dollar DVD bin. And Conrad Brooks shot some really interesting films such as um, Hellbilly Monsters, Grandparents from Outer Space, Jane Gao. So I was really familiar with his work. So, but Conrad the Gravedigger didn't have the right ring to it. So I literally Googled um, uh, top works of Victorian literature. I looked at the Wikipedia page. They had a list of characters. And I just went through the names until I was Gregor. Gregor the Gravedigger. Now, as an added bonus, Gregor and Gravedigger are near rhymes, and you have the alliteration. Gravedigger is also a visual reference. Mm. So it actually really helps you to remember it. And the interesting thing, if you're familiar with wrestling, yes. a lot of wrestlers have gimmicks. And one of the reasons they have these gimmicks, they're mnemonic devices. They help you remember the characters. Because imagine all wrestlers if they didn't have gimmicks. <laughs> could you honestly, could you honestly remember all of these wrestlers if they didn't have this niche thing that they were wrapped around? So that was cool. So I did Gregor the Grave Digger for Twitter for like a year or two. Then I was looking at my social media because I have I have different websites and I have different pages. And I was trying to think. A lot of them weren't working. I said, okay, which one's working? And the one was that was working was Gregor's. Wow. I was like, okay. Um, but the interesting thing is I really got to interact as Gregor. I got to be that. I would reply to post as that character. You. That's how I met you. You replied to uh, one of mine. Yeah. It is. If you're ever trying to develop a character, it is a great way. Make a social media page. Because it's like you're in a store and you get to wear the clothes before you buy them. So you get to practice with that character. And this is real life, real time interaction. I remember one day I was walking the store and they had a huge thing of circus peanuts. So I took my phone and I took a picture of the circus peanuts just where you can see like a huge pile of them. You couldn't see the store. I posted that on Twitter and said, um, I've, I've finished getting all my Halloween candy. As you can tell, I just really love children. <laughs> but one of the things about Gregor is I could, I got to do a lot of that graveyard humor that I love. Gregor would post little quips like, um, um, 
I trapped over my leg the other day. My fault for leaving it there, I guess. Um, but so w- once I had that, like I had the character. So I said, okay, t- Gregor's working on moving over to Instagram. I had no intentions of being a horror host, but I said, I did follow a horror host. And then they suggested another. I was like, okay, I'll follow a bunch of horror hosts. Surprisingly, a lot of them followed me back, which really, like, why are they following me back? Why are these? Then I realized, oh, Gregor the Grave Digger. They probably think I'm a horror host. I was like, man, man, man. Now, 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 I, now I gotta like. I probably have to say something. Like, I'm apologizing. I, I'm sorry you misstruck me. I, I didn't mean to deceive anyone. That I just had like this moment. I was like, wait, I should just be a horror. You know, it's cool, and I also don't have to admit to anything. <laughs> a lot of people say they have a lot of ideas. They do their first show, and then they've done all their ideas in the first show. What was your first show mm-hmm. like? Were you nervous and did you use up all your ideas? Okay, well, here's the thing. I was trying to really figure this out because logistically, yeah, so it's audio and that was a process in itself because originally I was thinking video. I was trying to think, how am I going to do this? And I was like, okay, I I got a shed. A grave digger has a shed. Okay, so that's a place because like it's a literal and the uh, show we call it the goal shed. It literally exists. It is a physical shed. And but I, I think, was like, okay, that's my set. If I can say, I think that is so cool because what what I love about horror hosting is it can be anything. Mm-hmm. And the, the fact that you are doing audio is like, it's almost hearkening back to the old time radio type thing because the, the best, the best, scene is what you can create right here and it's personal and um there's here's a little little secret here so i don't you probably i think you talked a lot about the public domain in here yes sir so anything before a certain time is under the copyright act of 1909 there was the copyright act of 1909 then was like the copyright act of 1976 The copy, and that's a big time, a big time period. So the Copyright Act of, I think there's some restrictions on things made in the 60s, but you know, honestly, in radio, television came out in the 50s, a lot of the shows had kind of run their course by that time. The Copyright Act of 1909 does not have a provision for audio recordings. Oh. None. So you have a lot of trouble finding stuff in the public domain. Like if um, in film, it's like this. In radio, it's boundless. It's literally everything. Wow. Sometimes music can be copyrighted because it can be put into like sheet music, it can be annotated. Right. But the selection, I can use (laughs) anything. So I can use anything. Since it's audio, I have an unlimited budget. Because you don't have to make anything. You make sound effects. I make all my sound effects. I enjoy nice. making sound effects. If my, my recommendation, don't get a public domain sound effect unless you really have to. Make it because it's so much fun. What is that like? What's that process like? Uh, I guess uh, you've been making them, so I guess you kind of know mm-hmm. what you what you need to produce a certain sound. That's fascinating. Well, I don't buy well, one. I don't buy anything to make a sound effect. I look around my house, see what I have. I actually got a tip from because uh, on my first um, show I did on um, Orson Welles' Dracula, because obviously that's an obvious choice. And there was this, I read something about the program. They said to get the sound effect of of driving the stake through the heart, they used a watermelon. So I was like, okay, one to my thread. I got some watermelon. I start squishing it like this. That sound effect is so useful. And a little trick on audio, you can be as violent as you want to be. Because you don't mm. see anything. 
True. And you can have some stuff that sounds really terrible. I think of one episode, Gregor now is like a pry bar through his foot. So I literally took a hammer, then I played the watermelon sound effect and just had Gregor screaming as loud as possible. Oh, it was beautiful. See, this this is so creative. And this is what I'm talking about. Fresh blood, new ideas, new takes yeah. on it. The only, I'm sure there's other people I'm not aware of, because I'm not aware of everybody, but I know Lord Lord Blood Rod does some yeah. re, he re-broadcasts some old-time radio, but adds some things. So I do know he does a little bit of that, but I don't know of anybody else that's really doing that that realm of sound. Yeah, um, because like I said, originally I wanted to do a video. And I figured out a few things. I figured I could use my shed. I already have a character. And I can change the hue. So I don't have to do any makeup. And I do short videos from time to time on like social media. And I just change the hue. So if you're like human flesh tones, it, they generally follow around the yellow range. So if you want to change that to green, you just have to keep in mind everything is going to everything around you is going to jump one color up in the spectrum. Green is going to be blue. Red is going to be orange. And if you're filming in front of a bookshelf, books can be any color. I got rid of anything that would be obvious like a plant. It's going to be weird when you have a blue plant, but nobody's going to like say, hey, that bookshelf isn't supposed to be green or those books aren't supposed to be that color. No. So like that was a short makeup solution in my wardrobe. I got a piece of um, black cheese cloth and a cloth and I just draped the chain over myself. And I wow. already have a shovel. So <laughs> literally I have everything I need for video production. But except for one crucial, crucial element, you might guess what that element is. A uh, graveyard. That would be helpful, but <laughs> time. Oh, okay. Because time you have to set it up. I have a little one who's like 20 months. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Uh, let me say congratulations. Oh, thank you. You are a folklorist. Correct. Okay, I've lived, I'm fr born and raised in Virginia, lived in North Carolina. There is something to me, in my opinion, there's something about Virginia, the mountains, North Carolina, the wooded areas. As the sun's going down and the and the dying sun's coming through the trees, for me, there's always been this feeling that goes right through me at that time. And it feels like, it feels supernatural. It feels like something otherworldly can happen. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about or am I just... So I live right by my, like, a, you know, my cousins weren't too far. We were, we were next door neighbors, of course, next door neighbors in the rural sense. So we went like here, we were like there. Right. And um, my, we left at the top of one hill. My um, cousins left at the top of another hill. And they had, you know, there was a big light by my house, a big light for our house. And sometimes we're, they would ask and honestly, like they're the kind of people that will ask to borrow a couple of sugar, then ask, can you bring it down too? <laughs> so while we're bringing down a couple of sugar, there's a depth because there's two like little, many hells. The scariest part about that journey at night was that depth. Because uh, like a stream would kind of go past it, but it was a really tiny one, but it was just super dark. So you could see them. You could see our house, but you knew you had to go through that little dark area. And it was just like, but it was kind of like, you know, like Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Once you're past the bridge, you're OK. <laughs> so you would walk, walk, walk. You would run. You would walk, walk, walk. The little stream would also come into the woods because you had a road. Do you have a little stream? Do you have woods? So it would dry up and there would be a path into the road, woods. So if there was anything supernatural and anything that was going to get you, it would get you right there and then. 
Yeah, but there's tons of folklore about Virginia. I have a book series, Ghosts of Virginia, that's three volumes on my shelf. I'm sure we'll ever find books or sold, but um, The Ghosts of Virginia by L.B. Taylor Jr. This is the volume two, but like I said, it's... um, And they're all this size. This is easily... um, Yeah, this is like 400 pages. Wow. Yeah, so usually if you got a lot of history, you also get a lot of ghosts. And it's, to me, it's fascinating folklorists. I love that. The, of course, that area is so just chock-a-block with all that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Look forward, all the creeps, look forward to the folklore episode because that's going to be amazing. I, I do interject bets and pieces. So my specialty is North American folklore, uh, particularly American folklore, but you know it. Like folklore doesn't really care so much about national boundaries. So it spells, there's a lot of spell over. True. And um, can you hear that airplane? I cannot, no, sir. Okay. So actually I have this running gag in my show because you'll hear an airplane. Then Gregor will say, always with the airplanes. Always, <laughs> always with the airplanes. They just think they're better than us. They have an air. They have an air, but maybe that's why they're called airplanes. <laughs> so I literally used the constant annoyance of uh, airplanes and just made it running gag. And sometimes when you can't hear the airplanes once it's recorded, uh, I got to insert an airplane in here. And- <laughs> <laughs> so what is the time frame from you get an idea for your show? Mm-hmm. Uh, the time frame from idea to the show is up. I usually try to do it in a month. Okay. Very important thing, it should be fun. I think my first month I did two, but then I didn't do something the second month. So it's like, I'm going to make this monthly. I do take breaks from time to time, but generally in a month. For me, that feels like the time frame where it's still fun, but it doesn't feel like work. And I uh, probably should talk a little bit about horror radio. And there's also a website, um, old time radio downloads.com that has a lot of this stuff and usually I get anything before like 1960 though honestly anything after then is probably like 1% of everything but I can guarantee you anything before 1960 that's good to use some restrictions for music now I did get flagged once by YouTube for using something a wonderful story called The Dark which was, and a lot of these radio series were made into TV series. The Dark came from Lights Out. Right. Had a very ominous um, beginning. Lights Out. Everybody. And it is later than you think. It would kind of like that. There's a wonderful story called The Dark. And I would never watch it if it was ever adapted in a movie. It's about a fog or a dark shadow that turns people inside out and like i was listening to it and i was like there was a disclaimer before certain episodes if you scare easily turn off your radios i never took it seriously (laughs) but then i heard the dark and the dark was like holy hell what did i just listen to because it's it's not a monster it's nothing you can see it's a fog that turns you inside out like a dark fog or a mess and it wasn't even described as a far fog or a shadow it was just the dark like this expanding darkness that turns you inside out yeah well i did get flagged uh, on youtube for it and the, it was an automatic flag i'm sure like somebody has it in their audio library some company so they automatically flag it i just put a note saying uh this was made this time, this is covered by the Copyright Act of 1909. The Copyright Act of 1909 did not have a provision for sound recordings. Even if it did, it would still need to be renewed because copyrights in nine, the Copyright Act of 1909 would have to be renewed. And you can actually search the renewals on, um, uh, you can search cal- copyright catalog entries and see if something's been renewed. You can do that through Google. And if you're working with old movies, that's a great resource to use because you can look and see, okay, and most old movies you're going to use are probably between 
you know, before 19, well, bef before the Copyright Act of 1976, where copyright change for the better. Now people can, re you can record sound recordings, which I'm very thankful for, but I'm also very thankful they didn't record it back then because unlimited, I can use anything. That's amazing. A lot of good information for everyone. Yeah. And it's kind of a good lesson is do your research. Yeah. Which you've, you've well, obviously done. Yeah. Well, the wonderful thing about being a folklorist, I will put books online that are hard to come by, folklore books. So I had to learn a lot about copyright before doing that. <laughs> So when I went into Gregor, I was already very familiar with what I could use, what I couldn't. couldn't. So the Library of Congress, or, or I think maybe it's like copyright.gov, they put out like these little PDFs that break it down very simply for you. I believe anything covered under the Copyright Act of 1909 had to be renewed in its 28th year. So if you're going to do something in the public domain, know why it's in the public domain. Because if you know why it's in the public domain, you're going to be pretty confident it is. Right. Things don't arbitrarily fall, fall in the public domain. Most things at the period, they didn't have the copyright renewed. I think with Night of the Living Dead, they changed the title. Um, very important thing for the Copyright Act of 1909, you had to put a copyright symbol. You don't have to do that anymore. But if you didn't have that symbol, it wasn't under copyright. I have seen your um, your show, and I know you mentioned mesh, mesh, ugh, I'm gonna screw, meshes of the afternoon. Yes, sir. Did not have a copyright symbol. Okay, okay. That's why that's in the public. But the audio from it, and you have to be careful with this, the audio is under copyright. Yeah, Um. so like there's versions of Meshes of the Afternoon that are online that have been rescored. So they didn't use any of the audio. You could show it as a silent film. It would work fine. It's more of a surrealist, so it doesn't really have any dialogue. Right. But that's really the only instance where I know known that I know of where maybe a part is copyright. The out, only other thing is maybe some of the Max Fleischer Superman cartoons. I'm not sure the theme to Superman is actually in the public domain. Okay. Because that's music. And music copyright is different than sound recording. And apparently and, I've heard on VHS tapes of movies from years ago if you get a mm -hmm. if you get a copy of the movie that didn't have the copyright thing at the beginning mm -hmm. it's pretty much fair game that that version of it is fair game but i'm not sure if that it really holds true uh well basically mm -hmm. here's an interesting tip um check to see if anybody's been sued for playing this movie <laughs> if you can if like nobody's ever been sued for republishing radio old horror radio old time radio for radio. So um, I should mention when I was going, growing up, I was a big Superman fan. So I got a lot of comic books and merchandise. And my uncle bought me a book that had Superman on the title. It was Superman, the radio scripts. Wow. So it was Adam, it was a character called Adam Man, who was different than this is different than the move they made a serial about it but in the serial he's lex luther adam man is the uh, a nazi heinrich melcher henry meller he's like the best superman villain that has never been in the comics but um i read the radio scripts and i loved them and ironically i have not listened to the actual radio of that <laughs> But I grew up knowing, okay, there was this thing called radio. It had shows. Um, and I, when I was in my teenager years, there was a website called Jedi Talk. And I did a program called Stormtrooper Bob, which was a Star Wars parody. But it was all in audio. And it was hilarious. And it was the first time I saw like a radio program adapted in a modern context. So where can people find your folklore stuff? A lot of it's on um, lumberwoods.org. I originally started in high school. I 
I really wanted this book of old folklore called Fearsome Creatures of the Lumber Woods with a Few Desert and Mountain Beasts by William T. Cox, because with a title like that, <laughs> who won it? I was fortunate, fortunate enough to find a copy. You can't get a copy now. Now it's a collector's item and eBay prices are astronomical. I should mention there's somebody who made a book with the same title that is not this book. I think that's just like a marketing gimmick. Right. Um, but there are some republications. But I, what I did is I scanned the images. I typed it up by hand because we didn't have what it's called an OCR, which converts print, printed paper into digital text. So I typed up the entire book and I put that on the website. So other people could get it because you couldn't get it, really, unless you wanted to hunt down a hundred year old book. Then after that, I just kept adding stuff and adding stuff. So now it's Lumberwoods. It takes it from that title, .org. You can also say .com, .net. I, I bought all three domains. It'll bring you to the same place. But it's a very particular type of folklore. And I did bring some of it into Gregor's program because on one episode, Gregor fights the Wampus Cat. <laughs> I think the same the same name on YouTube for the folklore. Yeah, Lumberwoods, yes. I have to point everybody there as well, because that's a fun channel, especially the shorts. Interviewed another guest called UFO Bigfoot about whether Bigfoot is real. Mm -hmm. I like I like to live in a world where he's real somehow. Okay. Now, UFO Bigfoot said maybe it's simply a trickster spirit. Mm -hmm. Because quite often you see UFO, there's UFO sightings. But can I just quickly get a quick opinion on the possible reality of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, because we have them here too. They're called Yowies. I'm sure you know. Yeah, I I'm familiar with them. Okay. Uh, I will make the distinction that I'm not a cryptozoologist. I am folklorist. Right. So um, the interesting, wonderful thing about folklore. So cryptozoology is kind of like, this thing is cool because it might exist. Folklore is just as this story is cool just because this story is cool. Like, it doesn't matter if it exists. It's a fun story. It's cool. It's wonderful. Something doesn't have to exist or be real for it to be a cool story. Now, as far as on the existence of Bigfoots, uh, Big Feet, Jeez. plural is kind of up to um, everything. Um I'm just going to give you this thing that will mess with your head, and I'll let you decide. Okay, so we're human. We're a finite being. We have finite perception. Our perception is limited. Everything we know in the universe that we know of, not that exists, is limited. Okay. The universe is infinite. We are a limited being in an infinite world with finite perception. When they say the universe is infinite that doesn't mean infinitely big it does mean that but infinitely infinite everything around you is not all that exists 100 percent. there is no possible way everything you see in here is everything that exists because we know it is we know we live in an infinite universe we know we're a finite being with finite perception so what is beyond the veil we don't know I try not to think about it because, again, finite being, finite perception, finite brain. I couldn't comprehend what is possibly beyond all we can possibly know. But the unknowable does exist. The unknowable is a thing. Whether Bigfoot is a some symptom of the unknowable, I can't possibly know. Obviously because it's not within my conception to know. That's a great answer. Such a such a yeah. great answer. The one, uh, I believe it was a short that I really loved was, I think it was the tree behinds. Hide behind. Hide behinds. Man, that was fascinating because who hasn't felt like uh, something's watching them in the woods, you know? Yeah. Now, I, I do with uh, my area of study and I have the top resource on my area of study. Hopefully it'll be one day thought of of an academic 
field of study, but even American folklore wasn't seen academically at first. Okay. That took time because, and some folklorists would say like, the Americas have no folklore. This was criticism overseas of us here and it's like, no, we have folklore. And Richard Dor Dorson, who is the father of American folklore, he said, America has folklore. What he said, it, we just have folklore that differs considerably from everywhere else. In uh, North America, we have interna uh, international folklore because we have lots of people from lots of continents. So even say something like Paul Bunyan, if I told you, Paul Bunyan, you have an image in your head. I'm going to tell you right now that image is incorrect. Because in oral tradition, when it's spoken, there are no images. The images are created in the minds of the listener. So one person, when he thinks of Paul Bunyan, might be an older man. Uh, one might be a younger man. Uh, one might be black. One might be white. One might be native. Um, and there's a whole nother thing. I like to call it the Paul Bunyan multiverse because every lumber camp told Paul Bunyan stories, but no one camp told them exactly the same way. Wow. So every camp had their own Paul Bunyan. If you know Babe the Blue Ox, never called Babe in folklore, it's a blue ox. Advertisers like to name things. Lumberjacks did not. In one story, he has one eye in the center of his forehead. <laughs> that was that was somebody's um somebody's blue ox had one eye. Wow. And in one little town in Creston, British Columbia, they had a Paul Bunyan, who is as equal as all other Paul Bunyans. Remember, each camp has their own. Their Paul Bunyan was flesh and blood. There was an actual person, they referred to him as Paul Bunyan. And even in newspaper, they clip claim and say refer to him as Paul Bunyan of Blue Ox fame. Now he had a he had a birth he had a regional birth name, but he was their Paul Bunyan. So if you want to know if Paul Bunyan exists in a small town in British Columbia, for about seven years he absolutely did. Because who's to say, like, this version is invalid to this version? I like the way, with Gregor, you mm -hmm. toss in comedy. Mm -hmm. And you can also be funny. Because because the the scary, the dark is fun. But if it's mm -hmm. all if it's all that, of course, it becomes kind of a drag. So I like the yeah. way you, you keep the comedy in. Because to me, like, Halloween isn't just scary. It's scary fun. It's those two distinct elements that make Halloween Halloween. And that's why I love Halloween. Also, Halloween's kind of really tied in with folklore, too. So that's great for me. But it's scary fun. And to me, without those two elements, it's just not quite the same. And I don't think any country does it better than the United States. And here's why. We have a particular type of humor in the United States, because we were founded as a democracy. Your form of government determines the type of humor your people have. Like, British is very sarcastic, and it's not as direct. There's, there's a reason why they needed not to be direct and bred in for a long time, and that shows in their humor. But in a democratic, a society found in democratic system of government, with freedom of speech, you can be as direct as you want to be. And you not just can you, you always have been. Now, of course, there are periods in our United States history where that is not the case. And yes, 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 I know. Uh, for a lot of our history, we could do so more so than a lot of other countries. So we have a very particular humor and it shows up in horror. Watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes. And like, honestly, if Freddy Krueger didn't have that humorous side, it, it, it wouldn't be the same. True. I agree. Because 
fright and laughter are such very intense emotions. And when you put them together, it's really quite something different. That's neither fright nor joy. It's a wonderful feeling. It's accelerating and it's also calms you down. What mm -hmm. about for yourself when you were young? What was your favorite Halloween character to be? Halloween character. Now, I live in rural Virginia. We didn't trek or treat every year because um, one year I trek or treated in my neighborhood. And like a wonderful old lady named Mrs. Codwell said, I haven't had a trick or treater here in 20 years. Here's a bunch of change. <laughs> she gave us money. It was awesome. But you're going to do that every year. <laughs> so sometimes my parents, they would actually drive me to my um, grandfather's neighborhood, which is a suburb of Richmond. I didn't so much get to peck my, um, sorry, frog in my throat. No worries. Not a literal one, like Gregor <laughs> might say, because um, he will say that. <laughs> but um, I didn't, so, so I had um, five brothers. We were a family of eight, working class family of eight in rural Virginia. My dad had to drive hours, did a night shift. We were on a budget. In an eight-family household in rural Virginia, you're going to be on a budget. So my Halloween costume was, you, you know, slim pickings. You, right. you get what you can get. Uh, I was Waldo from one year because, you know, I don't have to buy anything. My mom didn't have to buy anything. Striped shirt, glasses, you're Waldo. I did have right. an Oscar the Grouch costume. But I had this one thing. I, I got this rubber alien mask, not from the movie Alien. It was just a generic thing. And I love that thing. It was this huge alien bug because it was just wow. the creepiest thing you could have ever seen. And one time, one of my brothers stuffed it in a coffee can. And because we would like you got to understand in the 90s, we didn't have nice Amazon boxes floating around everywhere. You, if you ever seen a 90s or 80s box, it's been used like five or six different times. It has tape around it. So you put stuff in what you could. So we had a lot of coffee cans. So we put in a coffee can and it melted. It melted into goo. I was very disheartened. No maker, no um, name on it. Have can't you seen find it another since? one. No. Oh wow. How would I even search? I could search bug masks, but that's a pretty wide variety. Yeah. But I haven't really looked for it too much just because I understand the futility of that. But that was something I really loved. I also had a lot of horror soundtracks, Halloween music, because my mom gave me a cassette that said Halloween music. I'm sure she picked it up second hand somewhere and I, I played it and I said I really like this. She says, okay, because when your kid says you really like that, that's what you you get them. Right. So that's why I have um Monster Mash Sounds of Terror. I didn't have a radio, like a record <laughs> player, excuse me, as a kid. So I didn't get to listen to these, but I still have I just I'm completely like enamored with the artwork how yes the yellow moon shines mm. on the face and um when gregor did a program his program was titled fear after fright or horror right and the reason for this title was the kind of very redundantly and hokey fun titles like monster mash sounds of terror and i also have another one here um yes Blood curling terror horror stereo sounds to make you shiver. Yes, I had that one as well. And uh, this is, I, I have this one vinyl. Wow. H.E. Wells is the world of the wolves. That's actually hanging in my shed. But I, you know, thankfully, YouTube, you can find those on YouTube. So I actually did eventually get the lesson to them. But I also had, um, let me see if I do. I know what? Yeah, I also had like four CDs. This is kind of like one of those in sorts festival of fright, and they had these wonderful ghoulish names. And the thing about modern horror is they're going to name a movie like The House, The Room, 
the backyard, the bathroom, probably in a few years. I don't like that. I like my horror. Can, here's why. I was with my wife, and um, I'm I was in the army. I was stationed in Germany. I worked finance, and they were showing a movie called The Roommate. So it's like, okay, great. It's going to be a big fat guy in a Hawaiian sh uh, shirt, a lighthearted comedy about this guy who knows no hygiene. No, the roommate was not. Are you familiar with this film? Is that the one with uh, uh, what? It's the two girls sharing the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, 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 is that what I I described just now? <laughs> If I didn't like them before, then I definitely don't like those kind of titles now. And it's not that I don't like the movies. Like Jordan Peele has those kind of titles. And, and you know, the great movies. You can't, can't you just say monster or something? Even the movie Monster isn't about a monster. Just like make it easy for me. If I'm flipping through like a, a guide, I want to know what it is just by the title i'm a very very particular person you know like uh like roger corman titles yes sir now you're talking you he's know what you're very to the point there's no confusing it little shop of horrors yes there will be a little shop and there will be horrors in it absolutely exactly. so will we see gregor uh do some crossovers with some of the other horror hosts going, even as if it's an audio drop in, because that would be cool. I think I would love that. Um, I, I mean, I've communicated with horror hosts before and ironically, um, I caught the end of, uh, Lobo stream one night. And he was saying like, if you have a clip, send it in saying Merry Christmas, Mr. Lobo. Oh, I didn't even know. Really, I had messed most of the show. I didn't even know what the context was. So I was like, okay. So ran over to my shed, put up my camera, grabbed the shovel, rang like a little bell and said, Merry freaking Christmas, Mr. Lobo. Uh, that, that, that's in Mr. Lobo, Lobo's Christmas Carol. Congratulations, dude. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that's it. So he has popped up in there as a cameo. Um, love to do more stuff with other people, but I mean, my focus was right now was trying to make episodes. Right. Right now I have about six, which is, you know, that's a good, that's a good, good amount. I haven't done a lot of hard promotion yet. I have social media. I do make posts. Hey, what can your fans expect coming up? Well, uh, I mentioned AMC's Monster Fest. Now, I've mentioned a lot about copyright. So the reason why you don't hear about Monster Fest anymore is because they changed the name to Fear Fest. Which I get they want to expand the scope of like this marathon, the movies they can show, because not all horror movies have monsters. But I really like Monster Fest, or at least, you know, that one year that my parents had cable. Well, they had it for multiple years, not consistently it kind of went on and off at my home sometimes we had cable sometimes we didn't the interesting thing about the name monster fest is they did register a trademark for it their current status to that trademark is dead oh so there's this wonderful thing called trademark abandonment now you can have a trademark for as long as you use it so like Coca-Cola is still Coca-Cola. They still have a copyright and a trademark because they use it. But if you do not use it for like a few years, it will be abandoned. And guess what's abandoned is the name Monster Fest. So I said, wouldn't it be a riot if I made my version of Monster Fest and called it Monster Fest just to stick it to them? That would be so amazing. They, that's the next thing I'm working on. Gregor the Grave Digger. Now, I try to be humble. My character is not. So Gregor's, I recorded some audio. Gregor's told, what a great honor it is for me to be hosting. I feel honored to be nominated for hosting Monster Fest. Nominated by myself. 
So Gregor will be hosting Monster Fest. Oh man, that's going to be amazing. When when do you anticipate to release that? Hopefully, um, maybe this month. But you know, things happen. Life happens. Maybe April. Right. Definitely by April. But yeah, because because that's to me that's an insane idea. That's amazing. I can't. Not only for that. can I use their abandoned trademark, I can also poke fun at them. And, uh, you know, respect them, too, but also just make fun. And I threw in a joke and says, like, Gregor's talking, like, and now I'm hosting Monster Fest, which is the only Monster Fest in the entire world, including Australia, and nothing else in the world has this name. I will face no legal repercussions whatsoever. That is going to be amazing. All the creeps watch for that. Can we get the final thoughts from yourself and Gregor? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, from, um, okay, from myself. H here, make a social media account about a character, even if you don't plan on being a horror host. It is tremendously fun replying to people, even if you get scammers in your inbox. You can reply to, to them with the most ghoulish, outrageous, wonderful sounding stuff, and they will respond back to you because they were not expecting it at all. And I posted some of this on my website. I talked to uh, this one person, um, and I think they were trying to catfish Gregor, but I have the profile picture. Why? Why would you? Because he looks like a green gargamel. Why would you even bother? So it it asked that I have a house. So I sent them this picture of this dilapidated room with the floor falling out. And I said, you can have the, the dry spot. Then they asked, if you have a car. I sent them a picture of a wheelbarrow. I said, it gets great mileage. <laughs> And it's environmental friendly. That's awesome. I love that. And like I said, I never intended Gregor to be a horror host. I invented his character in a day. The name Gregor to grow. I was just. I had no more intentions to just have fun on Twitter. And I did. Because it's just fun, especially getting people's reactions. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, I tried other Twitter. I have a couple other accounts. I tried a pirate who also appears. I had a couple. I had a toy soldier and I did a pirate and I did Gregor. And all three of them actually appear in my last episode in the audio. Best, most practical advice I can give you is a quote from Arthur Ashe, famous Virginian. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. I like that. You do that, no more, no less. All you got to do. And um, if this is my last word, I guess my final thought would be, um, <laughs> let me try to get it. So Gregor speaks from the same place you hock a loogie out of. Regards from the graveyard and see you in the fear after. Mm -hmm.